You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. This is Mike Balzer of All Things 3D, and this is another week, 3D in Review for August 14th, which I guess is between the 18th or 8th uh, to this date. So, hey, welcome again. And I guess we can get right into the news. Uh, Chris had another uh, family emergency to take care of. Uh, we kind of postponed it later in the afternoon. Hopefully, uh, he'd be able to come on. It doesn't appear that he will be. So, it's just me again. So, on that note, let's move right into the first item. And what do we have here? Um, actually, I saw this in the news, and I think it's pretty cool. If some of you have been uh, looking into getting a laser cutter and just felt like, oh, that's a little expensive, especially some of the better ones out there, maybe this is something to look at. In fact, I am seriously looking at it, and that is the Endurance Laser Cutter Accessory for only $195. And there they show you in the previous slide. It appears they also do other things. But it's a diode laser, 2.1 watts, 40% efficiency. Um, it's kind of crude looking above there. But uh, if you look down here, they actually have it in a 3D printer. I guess there's a kit. Here's another uh, look at it that uh, allows them to just unplug the original extruder and, or hot end and put this in its place. Uh, here again, uh, it looks like they're using a 3D printed component here. Uh, here's some images down here. Now, what's interesting, I guess the, the heat sink is surrounding it. Yeah, there you go. There's your heat sink. So it actually looks pretty cool. Um, so I don't know what the, the type of mounting system is here. It's uh, in a box. Uh, I notice it comes with uh, the glasses here. But uh, if you're interested in something like this, I think this might be a, a good direction to go. Again, the company is Endurance and uh, from Endurance Robots. I notice that they also do other things. So if you're into robots, if we go back up here, uh, they create a telepresence robot, modified UDI quad quadcopter, drone helicopter, so obviously they've taken their skills and moved it into another area. So I will have to do a little more research on it, but it looks cool. And for $195, it sure beats the price of, uh, I don't know, they can range anywhere from 2,500 to 10,000. Now, again, you probably are limited to the size of the bed of your 3D printer, um, but it does provide some options there. Okay, well, let's move on to the next item. You know, with Chris not being here, obviously it's going to be pretty quick. I decided, since I cover a lot of news in a lot of other areas that we, we go through on our site, uh, show, I thought I'd go in and directly into 3D scanning or the 3D scanner darkly area and bring up what, uh, let me go to the right location. Oh, did I not bring it up? Well, I'll just go to this. There is a, a company that we wanted to have on, uh, I don't know, maybe about, maybe 10, 12 months ago, about the October, November timeframe, and we had seen them. And essentially what they do, and here's a, something to take a look at, uh, it's a, obviously a gypsum-based 3D print. But what their specialty is, and one of the reasons we wanted to have them on, is that they can scan using photogrammetry. Uh, in one one hundredth of a second images. Now, I hadn't heard from them. Uh, we tried to reschedule a few times, and I just, you know, kind of said that uh, I need to move on. Obviously, they did. They supposedly have a few sites, and the reason this came up, and I was hoping, here we go, is that <laughs> Mashable did a little video and write-up on them, but I noticed some starking uh, or information on this uh, that just seemed a little out of, what would you call it, out of reach or out of touch. One, if you watch the video, you'll notice that the video was done in a 
kind of a vacant store. The other thing is they didn't talk about pricing, uh, either one for the system itself or um, the cost of actually getting a 3D scan and print. Uh, from my understanding, when I did some research before, you, uh, as you can see here, it uses 54 DLSR cameras. Now, at $1,000 a pop that would be just in the cost of the cameras 54,000 add maybe 10,000 uh, for the the system that and I'll play the video in the background here to be able to actually yeah it's kind of a humorous video but it almost seems like a a promotional video for the company and like I said they didn't talk about pricing uh, they talked about bringing her in and there's a scanning booth there uh, this was the gentleman that i was hoping to interview uh, they talk about as you can see their dlsr is uh, behind this white interface and as mentioned it can capture in one one hundred second but if you look at the disclaimer that they add for their website uh, they take three attempts uh, and that's what you'll see here is they're actually creating three shots and then they uh use photogrammetry now they say they have proprietary software but when i looked at it before and asked them about it uh, before our interview it um, i came to the conclusion that uh, it wasn't really proprietary now it might be now but at the time it was just kind of off the shelf uh, software now i don't know what the type of dslrs are but i also had heard somewhere that their system they were trying to sell for about one hundred eighty thousand dollars um, even if that's true, that's somewhat steep and it's not something anybody would probably move into. So what they've been trying to do is set this up in, in different markets. Uh, they started out in Germany. I think they have two locations there. And they're looking at having three. They have one in New York, Chicago, and then another site. But I didn't see one in San Francisco, even though it does mention uh, that it has been. Now, supposedly also they can do uh, their own 3D printing, excuse me, printing in Brooklyn. But... Uh, I think that's also where Shapeway has some 3D printing, but uh, if you notice here, uh, obviously it's the very same type of uh, gypsum color printers that are used by Shapeways and others. And uh, with that being said, uh, again, there was no pricing and uh, a lot of disclaimers. Uh, however, uh, the quality is pretty good. Uh, another point is even though you can do very quick um, captures, they do say or to take or allow for about eight weeks before delivery. So if you were wondering what happened to them, they must have a few locations here and Mashable covered them. And if you want to watch it, it'll be a, a link in the show notes. So let's kind of move on to the next item. And uh, since this is kind of uh, our... Our particular episode on scanners. If you remember, we talked about the bevel uh, from a company called Matter and Form. Well, if you see here, they have actually exceeded their pledge of $200,000. So if you're interested in getting one, now remember, this was at a price of $49, attaches to the, the earphone jack on a smartphone, either Android or iOS, and allows you to do 3D scanning. And uh, we showed some videos before. You can always go out to their website. But notice that all of them are gone until you get into uh, March delivery in 2016. Uh, and then you can also buy a special price of 79 uh, From what I've seen, and we, we discussed it in a previous episode, really cool unit. Uh, I'm glad to see innovation like this at an inexpensive price. But that also brings up uh, something else that uh, that I wanted to talk about. And let me see if I can find it. Of course, that I don't have it up. But uh, we also had brought up another company. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And sadly, I had forgotten to bring it up. So let's see if I can do that now. Um, Yes. So let's actually go out to their website and uh, I had a video. And one of the things that I noticed and I thought it was a little bit unusual with them is that they, uh, they use green lasers. So I kind of thought about that. And I remember about a year ago, I worked on my own, you know, what do you call it, tabletop uh, 
line, uh, laser line scanner. And I had also come to the conclusion because of my experience in video and, and camera work that most cameras are more sensitive to the green uh, uh, wavelength. And uh, also it has less noise. Now, if you notice, I'm chroma keyed here. And the reason that I use green is, at least in a video perspective, it has the least amount of noise. And so when I contacted them and asked them that, they did tell me the same thing that uh, it, uh, and here we go. It is for the purpose of a cleaner image uh, because they're capturing it with the, the Android or the iPhone device, the camera within it. And so I think that was an important thing. Here he's talking about a five milliwatt green laser. And uh, because of that, and I was hoping to have a video, but uh, I'll have to go back in. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be here. Uh, so let me go back to my cell and let's see if I can bring it up real quick on my computer and bring it in, so. Okay. So um, here's actually, I'll bring it up. So here's the actual video I was speaking of. Um, here they're actually showing, what does it look like, uh, an iPhone uh, strapped to the side. So this is what's used for the monitor. There's your laser line scanner scanning across the object. Uh, so it's very similar to other uh, laser line scanners that I've seen in the past. And uh, they say it takes about five minutes for a complete object. As you can see here, we're only scanning a front surface. It's not rotating. So I guess this would be good for relief scanning. But if you wanted a complete object, you would have to obviously rotate the object itself. So there they have uh, how they're using the, uh, the iPhone to expand and contract or zoom in and out. And actually from here, the quality is pretty good. So again, as mentioned, they use the laser, or excuse me, the green line laser to reduce the noise and differentiate it from the, the surface. And I think that all hats off to them. Obviously they've got some smart engineers there. Uh, and again, jumping back to it, um, it will be, if I remember correctly, about $199. And I'm hoping uh, here down in the corner, you can see the little thing. Um, it will be on Kickstarter. I think they said September and uh, either they'll be on at the time their Kickstarter launch or right after on the show. But uh, I have some news later on. So more than likely it will be after the show. Okay, well, <clears throat> let's move on to another thing. And I saw this in on YouTube when I was doing some searches and I... Forge is an app that lets you 3D scan with any Android device. Plug in a depth camera, capture 3D models in real time. Walk around and scan every dimension of the physical world into digital form. Use Forge to take and share measurements for CAD work or 3D printing. Forge tracks 9 million depth readings every single second, fusing them with color video to create a millimeter accurate reconstruction. Really Your scan is saved and ready instantly. Piece of software that can use a connect Keep it private uh, or share a link so good. others can view it in a web browser. Using, think, uh, Capture scenes of unlimited size, sensor. always at high resolution. Yeah, Forge works with PrimeSense cameras, with support for other USB depth cameras coming soon. Save, search and share your 3D models. Forge from a bound labs. This would be a welcome addition because currently you can only use it on an iOS device. So we'll see. I, I'm hoping that uh, that will come out and uh, be available. If not, who knows, maybe he's working for Google or somebody else 
and uh, we'll be seeing some software somewhere that allows you to do 3D scanning on an Android device. And why? Because my phone of choice is the uh, Note 4. And if you remember the, uh, or if you've seen it, Samsung had an announcing of the new Note 5, as well as, I guess, a another version of the uh, Galaxy S6, uh, larger size. So they have two large phones now. And uh, both of them, I think, use quad HD screens. So with that being the case, uh, I would like to be able to utilize this. The other thing is that uh, some smaller tablets, like the one from NVIDIA, uses the K1 processor, which uses CUDA cores. So I would suspect, with that being the case, that it would be a pretty good uh, little tablet to do scanning uh, because of the CUDA cores built into it. And that's one of the big pluses in the Scanex software on a desktop. And I did ask that question to them, but at this time, they have no priorities in, in creating any Android software. Uh, so let's kind of keep moving on here. Um, I'm going to go right into the VR section, and I want to revisit Wearality. And if you remember, we had them on two weeks ago, and last week I actually tried out the glasses, and I had to say that I wasn't uh, that thrilled with it. Uh, part of the problem with the Wearality uh, glasses was the ridging. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe, but because it uses a Fresnel lens, you do have some ridging, and it is apparent. And maybe I was just a little sensitive because I, I do this, obviously, on a day-to-day -day basis and review multiple VR headsets and in glasses that I found it somewhat distracting. But I decided to continue with it and I kind of merged two different products together to come up with a prototype headset and I'd like to show it to you. If you remember some time ago, I talked about how it's gonna show up because it's green. Um, it's actually a green version, but there's a company called Stutzy that creates the VR Spective, um, which is a hard foam based uh, headset. And I was kind of intrigued with it because it's, it comes in a, a flat sheet that you have to pick out all the components. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to assemble. But uh, their current version, which is what I have here in my hand, um, allows for, and let me go uh, to my other camera here, allows for you to use a larger phone. So that's what I have done here. I have cut it out in such a way, notice my, my again, my fancy high tech uh, strapping system here. And you'll see in my next VR system why that actually is a cool idea and uh, I may explore that myself. But in the back of it, I took the Wearality glasses and mounted them inside there so that I could have a headset. I added a little more foam on the edges because I found that the Spectre VR is a little bit, a little bit, can't even talk, a little bit rough, uh, especially if you're going to wear it for more than a few minutes. So I then you pulled out my Note 4, which I have here, and I tested it. And actually, I found the experience pretty good. So I'm not going to go through the process of actually showing you because obviously you can't really see it. But again, the ridges are apparent, but it does appear to sh because of the, the way this is shaped and you can pretty much seal out all the light around you. Um, you don't have any backlighting that's causing the edges to uh, reflect or refract, creating those ridges that you see in the image. But what I did notice, and I mentioned this last time, is the image or the, the brightness off the screen itself uh, seems to uh, accentuate those. And I did notice that uh, because I'm pretty sure because it's a plastic lens to keep them light, there is some uh, chromatic, uh, what do you want to call it, not necessarily interference, but aberrations, uh, a little bit of a rainbow effect. But I've noticed that pretty much in every plastic lens. And uh, unless you get some extremely high quality glass or a, uh, what is it, a monochromatic? Uh, there's a particular lens system. It's heavier because it uses a, a dual lens uh, merged or melded or meld together in order to minimize the refraction and the bending that occurs at different wavelengths. Uh, is it anachromatic? 
maybe that's it. Uh, but it's expensive. In fact, I'm looking at getting a pair. Uh, you can get them on, on, I think, on eBay, but also Alibaba and uh, for about $45 a piece. So that's pretty much the price of an entire head system, uh, headgear or headset. So, but um, if you don't like the chromatic aberration, you can get it. Let's see. I think it's a 45 millimeter or 50 millimeter uh, focal length, which would be ideal for this because that's about the range of this one here. And then you'll see another lens system that I have. And if I remember correctly, they can, there are 37 millimeters in uh, diameter, which is ideal because then you can pop them out of your uh, Google Cardboard or something like that and pop these in it. And now the question is, are you going to get that much better quality? So um, who knows? I'll get back with you on that. But for now, uh, I think most people are satisfied with the plastic lenses. You can buy for about 5 to $6 a piece some glass lenses. But I have not noticed a huge difference by going to that. All right. So does that improve the wearability to put them in a headset? Yes, I believe so. Does it expand your field? Yes, it does. But again, as I mentioned before, especially with my Note 4, the screen isn't wide enough and you do see the edges. So I think with a six inch phone with the reality, I think that's where this thing would excel because it literally gives you a much wider uh, field of view. Uh, so that's something to experience. And the glasses currently aren't for sale. Uh, and, but they are looking at people to make these. So you might see these on the market with other people or they may come out with their own um, continued edition for those who didn't back their Kickstarter. But cool product, um, and I can see some things happening with it, uh, especially if you want a wider field of view. Okay, well, let's move right on to the next um, item that I have in the VR world. And I, for, I don't know how I came across it, but I noticed... Maybe I read somewhere. Oh, actually, sadly, I had backed a Kickstarter for, and I can't think of their name now. I'd have to go out there. But the Kickstarter was to create a iPad mini VR headset. And I said, oh, that would be kind of cool. And I also talked about them, about doing the Neo DVR, because uh, so, their original version didn't have much of a backplate. That's all changed. In fact, a lot of people are complaining because it's been almost, gosh, almost a year now, nine, ten months, and still nothing out there, very little information. And so a lot of people, like a lot of, a lot of things on Kickstarter are in uproar because they haven't heard anything or seen their product yet, even though it was prom promised months ago. But one person posted a link, and I thought I'd look into it, and it's a company called noon and notice the the icon if you're familiar with my four eyes design i use something similar but it's an infinity symbol but they call themselves noon and they're out of korea and uh, i looked at them online and i said wow that's kind of neat uh, they look very similar to the amido um, from france if you remember we i've actually modified that with my own faceplate, and uh, this was very much like that um, but uh, in the, I wouldn't say exploded view, but they showed this in a little different detail. There's a cover, and actually it's right here, that fits over the top of it so that if you put your phone in it, I don't know, I guess to provide some appealing look like wearing a headset is going to be very appealing to begin with. But uh, with this, without the cover, this is what you have underneath it. And I thought this was very intriguing because what I saw it in the, uh, uh, in the images, I thought this piece here, which is actually a, a rubbery, elastic type material, was actually a stiff plastic, but I noticed that it didn't seem evenly distributed across the top of it. So it's, I wish they would have chose black or some other color besides white. But uh, essentially, and I will show you right now, you take off the panel and it just, you know, there's four... Uh, what do you want to call it? Lips here that uh, go into the slots in the, the actual headset, and then you just push it down and it locks it in place. So I will use it with my Note 4 
and then I'll show what it, it looks like when you use the, uh, the iPhone 6. So if you can see here, down on the bottom, uh, are some little latches, and you actually have to use a Phillips screwdriver, small one, to move these into the right position. But essentially, they're like little paddles, and you vary, and I don't have a Phillips right here. Let's see. Yeah, I could get one later, but uh, for now, I'll just pretend um, that, let's see if we can move one. I'll just pull. Yeah, there we go. So you can just pull on them and move them. So notice the flaps are up. Now, for the Note 4 or larger phone, that's not necessary. But for, you know, smaller phones like the iPhone 6, you'll actually have to move those. So the cool thing is this just flip um, goes over the top of your phone. Uh, there's a latch on the other side, and it just kind of like a rubber band holds it in place. Kind of a better tech than uh, my little rubber band experience. And then you can turn it on. Look, and another nice thing about this, all your buttons are exposed, plus your headphone jack. So everything is in reach. And uh, there are two holes. I don't, you know, they could have probably opened that up completely, but you'll see in a moment why they did that. And then uh, essentially we'll find my little demo here, which I also did for uh, the Unity. Uh, this is actually my um, my OR surgery demo. Nope, actually this is the med office. But as you can see there, uh, it's available. And uh, so what we're going to do now is place this inside. I haven't checked to see if this has been Google Cardboard certified. Um, however, I have noticed it's about a 50 Oops, that didn't work out well. I'm gonna break it on there already. There we go. Okay, it's about a 50 millimeter focal length, so it's a little longer than the uh, Google Cardboard because I tried some other lenses. The other thing I noticed, and maybe you can see this here, is that there was a ring around the glasses itself. And the actual lens, even though it'll fit a 37, the actual lens is modified to create a flat ridge to hold it in place. And then there's a ring that fits over the edge of it. Well, I felt that occluded the, the outer edge, in my opinion, too much. Plus, it created a very dark, opaque ring that I felt was visible. So I took it off. And I felt that, that that actually improves it because it provides more of a blurry edge. Not that much, but uh, it was at least less in, intrusive, as in my opinion, than having the ring on it. So I will put them on. Of course, you know, like all goggles, you do look dorky. And one of the things I noticed, um, yeah, there you go. is that you have to, because there's no lining up like my case, is, and you can't hear me, there's no lining up uh, like you have with my Neody mount, uh, Neody VR faceplate. You have to align it yourself, and you can either do it before you mount it or slide it around, but it's not that difficult. And then there's an adjustment on top for focus. And uh, it actually works pretty good. There is no IPD uh, adjustment, so it's pretty much set. But I notice as you, because um, what it does is it moves the lenses closer to your eyes, it seems to kind of do the same thing a little bit. I, did, I noticed at least the ring effect as it got closer to my eyes uh, was less pronounced. Uh, how does it fit? I think it fits pretty good. I've noticed that the, the cushion is a little thin. Um, but it's rubbery on the other end, so it's not hard plastic. So it does com conform pretty well to the face. Uh, it's a slim design, almost like a little small scuba mask, uh, which is probably the reason they show that on their website. And uh, and I thought the lenses, because they're a little smaller, would impact it, but it doesn't. And the the area for your nose is wide enough, especially since I've got a wide bridge nose. But the only thing that I think they kind of scrimped on was the actual headpiece. Um, it's just basically an elastic band 
I've noticed companies like Samsung and others um, provide a little more security uh, and, you know, I guess comfort in the band itself. But like many things, you could replace it. Uh, it comes with nice little hooks here. What do you want to call it? Strap hooks. So you could easily replace this with a much better headset if you if you so need to. But uh, I found that it was fairly comfortable. And uh, what I thought was really cool is one of the reasons I contacted them was creating a new bracket for it. And then I realized I may not have to do that. So let me show you why. Taking off the plate, and again, because I already know this, if you move these little paddles up, and then I will bring over. And now this is a specially modified um, Neo, excuse me, Neody mount bear edition, where I put the magnets directly onto a case, which gives me the same thing as my own case, except I don't have the, the grip and shoot um, bottom portion. So, uh, but it could be a lower cost uh, direction to go. Um, and obviously in this case, one of the reasons I did it is it provided me a slimmer case because the reason I did that is I wanted this as close as possible to the plate because I strapped up and it does stretch it. So one of the things I would like to do is add a little plastic extension that you put on the top of this and then you put the uh, rubber. But for now, it does seem to stretch a little bit more, but it does hold it securely in place so that it sits there without having to buy a special bracket. Now, it's a little bit in my opinion, it wasn't made for the iPhone 6. I would still recommend the Humida uh, system that I have. But I found that it works much better with larger phones, in particular, the iPhone 6 Plus uh, and my case system. So as I said, you have to make sure your paddles are all the way up so that it puts it in the correct location. I will go ahead and bring up the... Oops. The structure sensor demo, which, yeah, I forgot to charge the, the sensor. But there you go, it's inside there. And then again, you just attach it to the front plate. And voila, you now have a new version of the Neodi VR system, as said, more specific to the 6 Plus. What's the cost of it? On Amazon, you can buy this headset, the Noon headset, for $79, I believe. So it's a little more expensive than buying the Hamida on Amazon. And let me jump to their website. Notice the, the scuba diver there, or at least. Um, but they have their own applications. As mentioned, I don't know if they're Google Cardboard certified, but I noticed that the standard cardboard certification seems to work just fine with it. In fact, if I were to modify it, I would probably extend it a little bit. Um, and uh, I will also create a little extension bracket down here so that it doesn't stretch as much. But with that, you can essentially put it on the front of your uh, uh, your Neody Mount Plus case with your iPhone 6 Plus and have a headset that works very, very well. And uh, the optics are good. I'm very pleased with it. Um, I like it. So as mentioned, I will create some accessories for it soon. And uh, it is available on Amazon right now. And you can head out there. So hey, good job, uh, Noon, for coming out with a affordable headset that anybody can use that obviously can be customized to hold the structure sensor. So uh, let's see if we got anything else. Since I was doing all that, my note pad went to sleep. So let's see, there we go. Uh, okay, well, that's about it in the VR corner. So let's move on to medicine. Uh, I, thought, I thought this was a, a really good article. Essentially, it talks about 
three company or, or 11 companies that they thought were leading in bioprinting. Obviously, if you read the comments, there are a few people that others felt they'd forgotten. This might be a little squeamish for some people, so keep that in mind. But here are some uh, actual facial tissue that's been bioprinted. Uh, and they're out of San Diego, and we have seen them before. I think we've talked about them. Uh, Cyfuse. Here's one of notable uh, or notable noteworthy to myself because I actually met the gentleman who created this at Medex, and uh, when I was giving a a talk there, and uh, yeah, it's a kind of neat little printer. I was. Didn't think that it would be this much when they actually made it available, but for our medical community, uh, that's well within, I guess, most people's budgets. And the reason he created this is not necessary to rep or replicate anything, but to create a biomaterial for testing, such as drugs and so forth. And uh, moving on, Aspect Biosystem, uh, 3D Biosystem, Row Ro Kit. Uh, which I thought was kind of an interesting uh, take on creating uh, a, a bioprocess by using multiple chemical there, uh, others. So as mentioned, some people thought that there are many others out there. The one that I thought was interesting is 3D printing dura matter for use in brain surgery. Uh, and if you're aware what dura matter is, that's the external sheath around the brain. And... Uh, Kind of interesting. Uh, this could have been beneficial to my wife uh, since they actually had to remove some of the dura. And I don't recall how they patched it. I think they may have just uh, either brought it from somewhere else or just left it exposed. I don't think that's the case. Um, so I don't remember. Maybe it was a membrane from some other location. But this would allow you to obviously grow your own cells into the dura that can then be used to replace. And obviously that is the direction they're wanting to go. Uh, currently, in the future, they'll be able to utilize this to replace organs. But if you followed our show, uh, the researchers from Houston think that's way, or Rice University in Houston, still a long time from now. Okay, so on the note, um, let's look at, oh, this is kind of cool. Let me bring it up. You know, we've talked about Onshape for some time. <laughs> And if you're into engineering or CAD work, you may have uh, a need to use uh, 3D CAD to design objects. And that's been the case for me. And uh, let's hopefully it'll come back up here. So it's going, okay, here it comes. But uh, one of the things that makes on shape different is that they're completely cloud-based. In fact, their client, I think, for the most part, resides on the cloud. So you can use it in pretty much any internet browser, um, but they have just released uh, a tablet, or at least the Android version, uh, which I can show you, and for whatever reason, uh, this device isn't bringing up my work. Hmm. what I get for allowing it to go to sleep. Let's see if I... Yeah. All right, let's see if it comes back. Here we go. So I'm going to... I can show it to you, but uh, even better. Let me drop it out uh, and bring it back on AirPlay and uh, let you watch it on the screen, so. So here is the iPad version of it. And as I mentioned, I'll show it in a moment. This is also available for Android. So if you have an Android phone, iPhone, or uh, a tablet, either type, it will work with it. And as you can see here, you use your finger to allow you to rotate and they've got a nice little tutorial and once you and you can go over here and actually identify a particular view if you can see over here on the right hand side of the screen uh, like a top view let's go front view actually i want a back view there we go and then you can use a long press 
and then bring up kind of like a magnifier that allows you to select different uh, parts of your model. And then you can do certain things with them. So what I'm going to do here, because uh, one, it's one of the few commands I know right now, is I'm going to, and it's the most dramatic, I'm going to thicken this. In fact, there, you can probably see it right now that it is five millimeters thicker. So I found that, uh, especially in this model, since as I've said before, I use Fusion 360, and if you haven't recognized it, this is a Neody mount case, I have found that it's difficult to exclude uh, different large sections, um, especially with a lot of uh, curvatures. I found that with this software, it was very easy, dramatically easy, by using this Thicken tool. And I don't remember if there's a similar tool, excuse me, tool in Fusion 360. If there is, I haven't seen it yet, but you know, if you're out there and you say there is, let me know. But uh, I think it's kind of neat. Um, you have a wide assortment of tools up on top. I'll go through them real quick. Okay, and this is the free version. They have a paid version, but the free version allows you uh, to work on multiple devices. I think it's kind of cool because I'm going to, well, if you notice, I just thickened that particular portion in the, the recessed hole there. And I will go to the uh, Android device here in a moment. And because it's cloud-based, this change is already available on the Android version. So I think that's kind of neat. But again, the tools up on top are real easy. Exclusion tool, um, drop to revolve. You know, if you're in the 3D CAD sweep, uh, come on, loft. I mean, basically the tools that you're familiar with in most other packages like um, Inventor or SolidWorks are in here. And I think that's pretty cool. They also have component placement and uh, friction analysis and some other tools. And one of the things that I mentioned, I think last week or the week before, they've teamed up with Maxwell to create photorealistic rendering. I just got a, a what do you want to call it, a test license to be able to look at that. Uh, it will be released, I think, next week to the beta group. And then I think in September, it'll be available as a add-on for their new version of Maxwell Render 5.2. Uh, but you can get a free license of that as well. Uh, now, as I mentioned on the show, Fusion 360 has the uh, the photorealistic render built into it, and I find it very easy to work with to create some good results. So I'm going to hopefully not shut down my no no nodes and uh, bring up on shape on this device. And uh, this is a Samsung 12 inch, so. Obviously, let's see, here we go. So I just updated it. So I'm gonna load the information and I don't have this on an HDMI connection. So let me bring up the assembly. Okay, and then it's loading it right now. There we go. So if I turn it around, there. I found that it'll be a, it was a little more sluggish on the Samsung uh, than the uh, the uh, the iPad. Now that's an iPad Air 2. I haven't tried it on the, as I mentioned, the NVIDIA with the K1 processor but it is a smaller screen, whereas the, this is a 14-inch screen. It has about the same resolution, if I remember correctly, as the iPad Air, maybe a little bit better. But there you go. I don't know if you can see that. I'll zoom in a little more. <laughs> as you can see, that change. Oh, you can't see me right now. So there we go. So here I've been talking and you've been still looking at the iPad screen. So here you go. Um, here is the Samsung 12 inch. And uh, same change that you saw in the previous version is now in the cloud and on the Android device. And then I could go to the desktop version and see it as well. Um, 
I like the way that they handled the tools. It's fairly intuitive. Uh, you just essentially do a long press, even on the Android, and then select the surface that you want to modify or change or add to, and uh, you can commence to do so. I don't know if I would choose that direction. One of the things I haven't tried yet, since the Samsungs or the Android tablets can use mice, mouse, mouses, somebody I just listened to said that's the way to say it, plural, and a keyboard, I would be interesting to see how this would work uh, with a mouse and keyboard on an Android device, if it is even supported. Obviously, you can use a keyboard with an iOS device. So I think hats off to them. They really come a long way. And gosh, I look back at when I started the account, I think it was in January. So, you know, here we're almost in September and they now have it on multiple devices and they're making relationships with a, a lot of different companies. So I'm keep giving them the eye as far as uh, maybe moving some of my CAD work over to it. So if you're on the fence, haven't even tried uh, to do any CAD yet, you know, give them a try. I think they're an interesting uh, company and they're obviously moving forward to, to become a mainstay in the 3D CAD market. Okay, on to my next item, which means I have to go back and change this over. What do we have? I thought this was kind of funny. Let's see, I have it. Uh, I'll bring it up. As you know, we've talked about 3D fabrication in homes for some time, and obviously China has led the way in that. But there is a group out of, I think it's uh, UCLA. No, I could or could not. Yeah, UCLA Architectural Department. We're creating tiny homes, and they're saying that uh, more and more people might be living uh, in something like this, um, where it says where the typical American lives in 20 cents, the tiny houses are likely to contain just 400 square feet. But uh, I don't know if I'd like to live in Essentially, it's about the size of a room. But uh, what do they talk about? How they actually created this using a company called Future Lab, and 3db uh, where did it say that sorry hmm. maybe it's a little bit further there's a company they teamed up with here it goes 3m future lab microhome is made out of a uh, material using the voxel and jet let's see if it takes me out to them um, which i think we've covered in the past but then, you know, here we go. So obviously these are very large printers, but it creates a particular material that's environment friendly and may or may not be recyclable, but also helps in retaining heat uh, because it's somewhat of a porous like uh, structure. And I guess it's a demo of possibility of these, I think these things here were 3D printed or in this case rendered, uh, the possibility of them being 3D rendered. I don't know why Sculptio is part of this. My experience with Sculptio haven't been too favorable. Um, but uh, I think that's kind of neat. I don't know if I want a tiny home, but I guess we could put, yeah, if you see there, that looks like it's on a, uh, a trailer bed. So you could just use it as an interesting mobile home. Imagine going to a mobile home park with this. Oh, well. So that's my architectural item. Let's move on to Windows 10. And I'm not going to bring it up. All I can say is the machine I'm using right now has been updated to Windows 10. Um, I actually updated uh, the tablet that I've talked about previously, the Acer, uh, that I use with the little RP. Oh, come on. Now, see, things good. There we go. <laughs> uh, so if you're familiar with Windows 10, this is one of the striking sc startup screens that come up. They've got several. And in my case, I'll, with the tablets, you scroll up. Um, you had the selection even on the desktop of now using a PIN number instead of a password. Uh, obviously, I chose to use a password, I mean a PIN number. And uh, 
Then you have your tiles. Now it automatically knew that it was a tablet, so this is the type of screen that comes up, but you can change that. Um, I don't know where to go right now. Let's see if that's it. Now that just brings up the menu. But uh, you can change that back to a desktop if you would prefer that instead of a tablet. But what I've heard a lot of the, as they were called in the past, Metro apps have been changed to modern. And some of them are getting quite good. I guess somebody mentioned the Audible app, if you're into audiobooks, is quite good. The, obviously, the Skype app and uh, some of the Office applications, especially with the new upcoming 2016, will all be touch friendly. Um, so on that note, uh, let's see what else. Kind of a cool feature. If you're not familiar with Windows 10, you now have dynamic or uh, and I only have one here, but you can have multiple window structures that we brought up Cortana. So that if you, let's say if you have two or three monitors, or in just case you have one, you can set up different work spaces. And like Unix and Mac, you can bounce between those workspaces. Um, I have some systems like this one here has three, but uh, if I only had one or a laptop, that might be very nice to move back and forth very quickly because uh, I like a lot of desktop when I'm working. And then the the um, common Windows off to the side, which I think has been around since Windows 8, which actually is what I'm in now. The menu is the top item, and then you can select one of your applications from there. Um, I'm very surprised that uh, it runs very smoothly. Some people said that they're having issues, uh, like Lenovo said, or not, Sony said that some of their desktops don't support it, but people said that they've um, loaded it up anyways with no problem. I have loaded it up, I think, on seven desktops, three uh, laptops, and uh, two tablets, and it seems to work just fine. Uh, so if you're on the fence about Windows 10, give yourself a few days Make sure you back up all the critical information. Um, but I would give it a thumbs up if you're a Windows person. Uh, if you're a Mac person, you know what's coming around the corner. And that is, a lot of people have El Capitan. And uh, I've been working with that as well. And it seems nice. It's got some features that Windows has. Windows has some features that the Mac has. You know, pretty soon, why don't we just create one operating system? No, just kidding. But uh, yeah, so Windows 10. It's been, been my main project of the week, and uh, it's been very successful. I do want to bring up something that hasn't been successful. I had a MacBook Air, and I say had because I blew it up, I think, Sunday night. I just finished a new build uh, getting uh, Metal, which is now available in iOS 9 working, uh, in Scene Kit, and I was really excited about it. And I pulled the uh, lightning cable off the iPad Air, and I just let them dangle. Well, guess what? That's not a good thing to do with a lightning connector. And I don't know if you can see this, but the lightning connector is charred on one side. Now, the thing that kind of surprised me when I first saw that, I know it's somewhat blurry, is that the fingers or the pins, the, the data pins themselves are exposed. Now, if you look at some of the other jobs, let's see what for example, the standard USB. Notice they all have a, a cowling, a metal cowling around it, which is the shield, but it also protects the pins inside of it. Same thing with the mini USB, as well as the micro USB. You know, I can go on and on. HDMI. Micro HDMI. Pretty much every connector I have seen in the past has had a shield. But what did Apple do? They created something without a shield. And wouldn't it be my luck that this fit right nicely into the gap in one of my, you know, because I didn't push it in all the way or it loosened up. But for whatever reason, the two fingers are, you want to call it the uh, AC receptacle male pins uh, were slightly exposed. This fell between it. Whereas if I had used something like a micro USB or mini USB, 
it would have charted, but it would have only taken out or shorted along the shield. This connected one of the data, sent it through the pins right up into the MacBook Air and blew it up. It also blew out my was a dual port pin on my uh, desktop LCD panel. So that no longer works. Luckily, most LCD panels have more than one port, but uh, it was a sad day for me, Sunday evening, actually it was Sunday morning. I think I actually shed a tear or two, it was bad. So luckily, good old eBay, I haven't ordered it yet, but I should be able to replace the board for about 250. The other huge concern I had, so for those of you who find yourself in a similar situation, you can remove the back on the MacBook Air and you can pull out the SSD. Now that's not an ordinary SSD. It is a special PCIe, uh, mini PCIe, that's different than an MSATA, even though the, the pinouts or the the extension looks the same on both of them, it is different. So on Amazon, Geez, between Amazon and eBay, they've got you covered. I was able to find a, an adapter to make it into a standard uh, SATA connector, and then I was able to use a SATA to USB 2, hook that up to my Mac Mini, which I have to use until I get this fixed. And it's slower, sadly. And I was able to bring in all the builds that I thought I had lost. Luckily, some of them I'm using GitHub for, but the others... I didn't, and I was kind of in a panic. I would have lost a week or two of work on my BioStep capture. So luckily that did not happen. So keep that in mind. These lightning ports, in my opinion, suck. Uh, I don't know why they went away from the shield. Um, and in my case, it cost me my MacBook Air. Sad. So keep that in mind. It's exposed data connections. Uh, make sure you just don't leave it dangling with one end still connected to a device. Not a good thing. Okay, so on to, yeah, we talked about the Noon VR already, which I give it a hearty thumbs up. And uh, so where are we at? Well, actually, I wanted to bring up this. If you remember, if you've been following us for some time, there is a little product, or actually a guy had created this, and we saw that in the news, and we said, wow, we've got to have this guy on. And we did. And uh, he, gosh, what was his name? Aaron Thomas. Uh, he has an interesting story. He is actually from India. And at the time, he was uh, living with his mother because he had lost his job with a, uh, a 3D uh, effects company in India which I thought was a little surprising ironic after talking to some people who had a similar thing, similar thing happen in America. And uh, so obviously the, the 3D visualization market is somewhat cutthroat. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say factory oriented, but uh, creating the effects uh, with some skilled people is now available worldwide and since it's digital you don't need to be physically located so a lot of it's being farmed out india was one of those companies at one time uh, then it went to brazil and china so they're all competing for the low end uh, it really is a cutthroat market and <laughs> i'm glad that i didn't pursue that as a long-term career instead of just as a hobby or uh, working with an independent company and creating some local in-house stuff but back to our friend Aaron, he developed this. He had gotten with Ultimaker because I think he did it on the Ultimaker 1. And they actually started, yeah, here we go. Here's the Ultimaker 1. They started taking this around the country uh, and all the shows like CES and showing it off. In fact, I think there was a very, a huge one made. And this is, I don't know if this is a smaller or larger one, but they have a very large one that they created. So they must have scaled it up two or three times. And uh, so this was very interesting. So I kind of asked myself, what is he doing now? And uh, sadly that Chris wasn't here because we kind of scripted it out. And it uh, looks like he's going to have something exciting to bring to the show in September. Uh, and I think you're going to be really interested in it. Uh, he's obviously not sitting on his laurels with this and his fame from Ultimaker. 
he does have something cool in the works. Can't tell you about it, but if you thought the Ronin was cool, you'll really like what he's got coming up. Okay, on that note, I think that's about it. Um, well, actually, we've got one more thing to talk about, and let's see what's going on in where are you at? In our calendar. And uh, it'll be important this month. So I will use this as a backdrop. I am going to go on a hiatus for a little while. Uh, I'm not going to call it quits, but uh, my health is not as been as good as it needs to be. I had some testing over the last week, and I have decided to kind of take a break uh, from a lot of things right now to get myself back on track. And uh, when I do come back, more than likely, we're going to go to a monthly schedule. So with that being the case, more than likely, we won't be back till October. So we'll look at what's going on in the month of September. We have the 3D Print Conference in Kiev. We have the... 3D Print Show in Pasadena. This has been popular in the past. Uh, we have another location in France, 3D Print, which has also been a, a good show. So worldwide, there's a lot of good shows. And then in September, we have the Maker Fair, which has always uh, brought in some great people, not only in the 3D printing, but in a lot of, a lot of maker area. I did cover it extensively uh, when it was in San Mateo. And there are all kinds of people there, and the same thing in New York. Uh, it's also a good place for people to bring out things to show. So if you're in that area, uh, don't hesitate to go. I think you'll you really enjoy it. If you've been there before, then I don't need to ask you to go again. You'll be there. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of people, even from the West Coast, uh, take some time to go there. And then uh, end of uh, September, October in Birmingham, uh, a show that uh, is not on here that if you're interested in is MedX up in uh, Stanford. They have been doing a display every year. They've invited, invited me to come up and uh, depending on my health, and uh, but I'm looking at if I take a break, uh, concentrating on, as I talked about, OR surgery, which is the Neodi VR experience that allows you to participate in a surgical process ask questions. Uh, that is the goal, at least, so that you're literally in a, in a surgical environment. Uh, in fact, I may have a sneak preview demo up in the next week, so take a look for that. Um, but other than that, I don't remember what day. I think that's mid-September. So if you're in the Stanford or the Silicon Valley area, don't hesitate to go to that. And then hopefully, if everything goes back, we'll be back on the air in October. Uh, like I said, though, we'll probably go to a monthly show. Uh, like I said, my health's important to me. The other issue is that I put in about about 20 hours a week in doing this show, and there's been very little financial compensation, uh, like none. And uh, even though I get a lot of thank yous from the audience, yourselves, uh, doing it is, I guess, taking its toll. A lot of things have taken on its toll lately. Um, so I'm going to back off. And uh, so see me again probably October. As you know, Chris has had some own family issues. Uh, my son has had some issues. Um, so we're, we're, we're all probably need to take a step back, relax, and uh, come back at a later date uh, and reinvigorate this. As you can notice, I'm probably not as excited, probably tired. I know my voice is sounding tired. And there's one other thing that I want to talk out, talk about before I leave, and uh, that is a company that I have, I guess, I don't work for them, but I have created products for them, and that's Occipital. And uh, I just feel that, uh, that the amount of effort and time that I put into creating the products that other than you, my audience, who's taken some time to possibly look into them from hearing about them on the show all the time. Uh, I have gotten very little public knowledge uh, from Occipital themselves, even though they've supported me with some earlier uh, betas. They've 
may I say, drag their feet a little bit for whatever reason on getting some of these updates out there, in particular the Neody Mount case that works with the iPhones. For whatever reason, I have my suspicions. Uh, they have not released anything to allow the iPhones to work with it, uh, while a company called 3D Systems has. Uh, they have also released their own cases, uh, and I see the same thing happening in the VR area. And uh, I don't think it's a good idea to compete with a company that you're using their product to develop your own products with. So I'm probably going to have to refocus, um, concentrate on one particular area. Um, what I've done already is made my items available on Shapeways, which is where I pretty much go to get my items created and at basically their cost plus 20%. Uh, which I think is still a very good deal. You'll have to do your own finishing. I will provide the sources for the materials. As mentioned, I have taken the time to uh, look into getting these patented and have filed as well as uh, copyright. So currently it is pending. Um, but if you are interested in following up and looking into licensing this for me, I would be happy to work with you. We're working on a special deal. Uh, especially if you want the CAD files or STLs, which I will not make available at this time. Um, but uh, I'm pretty much going to give up the, the factory uh, portion of that. Uh, it is sadly not made enough money to even cover the expenses. If anything, I'm kind of in the hole with it. So I'm going to have to pull back with a lot of things and uh, kind of regroup. So on that note, I uh, hope it's not too much of a depressing no, for just keep in mind that uh, uh, if things go well, I will be back and uh, we'll continue the show. I thank all of you out there for providing, you know, the the time and uh, to be part of the show and uh, provide me feedback and provide me suggestions. If any of you are out there who have been a guest on it, thank you very much. Without you guys, you know, I wouldn't have a show, and uh, it really has allowed me to see how worldwide all this is. So, okay, on that note, uh, I'm going to leave on a happy note. So thank you, and I will see you hopefully again in October. Bye.